precision delivery of medicine. Entertainment franchise games absolutely exploding. Small modular reactors and the nuclear renaissance, plus AI moving into very complex workflows. Now, these were just a few of the major tech innovations that partners at A16Z predicted last year. And our partners are back, and we just dropped our list of over 40 plus big ideas for 2024, a compilation of critical advancements across all our verticals, from smart energy grids to crime detecting computer vision, to democratizing miracle drugs like GLP-1s, or even AI moving from black box to clear box. You can find the full list of 40 plus builder worthy pursuits at a16z.com slash big ideas 2024 or you can click the link in our description below. But on deck today, you will hear directly from one of our partners as we dive even more deeply into their big idea. What's the why now? What opportunities and what challenges are on the horizon? And how can you get involved? Let's dive in. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only. Should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. Please note that A16Z and its affiliates may also maintain investments in the companies discussed in this podcast. For more details, including a link to our investments, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. I'm Angela Strange, a general partner on the A16Z fintech team, and I think in 2024 will be a significant rise of the developer as the buyer in financial services. Historically, financial services infrastructure purchases were mostly driven by the economic buyer. What's my ROI? Or the business lead? Does this solve my use case? But there is now a third increasingly influential constituent, the developer. Look no further than Move's growing FinTech Developer Conference, an associated 4,000 strong community. In tandem, developers at larger financial institutions and insurance companies are becoming more influential in buying decisions. The rise of a developer as buyer in financial services companies of all sizes favors new entrants. For FinTech companies that pride themselves on a great developer experience, this will play to their advantage. Fintechs are already prioritizing the creation of developer sandboxes to let customers try before you buy, and are even open sourcing parts of their solutions. The developer buyer would, of course, prefer to get a sense of how the product works prior to implementation. But isn't that strategy also better for everyone? For larger financial institutions selling their infrastructure, appealing to the developer will be a new muscle that may require improvements in product architecture, including up-to-date documentation. Still, it's clear these institutions are recognizing the need to influence the developer as well. All right, Angela, I watched your talk from FinTech DevCon a few years ago that documented this shift, this multi-generational shift from marble to code. I love that line. And the ability also for almost any company to participate in this financial ecosystem, not just banks. I think it'd be great if you could touch on that history to really set the stage for this important new buyer being the developer. If you ask most people who has influence in the $25 trillion financial services industry, they'd probably say the finance leads or the lines of business leads. And what's happening now is there's a third very influential constituent, which is the developer. And this has dramatic implications, not only on how financial services are built, but then also like the services that we receive as consumers and businesses. And I think any time you talk about a big shift like this, it's sometimes helpful to walk through super briefly like what have been the big eras, just to, just to underscore the importance. Um, and, and this is where the, the marble, the code um, sort of framing came from. And so you think not that long ago, uh, banks were built out of marble and they were only concerned with keeping physical money safe. Fast forward to, to recent history, the mainframe arrives, you know, banks obviously have to keep virtual money safe. Those mainframes are still where, you know, 99% of dollars in the US are, are settled. So the trend that we've been talking about over the last, uh, over the last several years has been the shift to as a service. And so it's taking some of the elements of the banking stack and making them such that financial services moves from something that traditionally only banks could do to now something that any company can do. Examples, Lyft can add bank accounts for its drivers, or Procore can add you know, payments and bank accounts for their plumbers. 
And what has happened is any developer at one of these companies and even at the banks has discovered that even though we have these as a service layers, there's still a lot of stitching that needs to go on to, to put these things together. Um, you know, and then to state the obvious, developers are very smart. So anytime they find themselves building something over and over again, they will find a way to, to automate that and oftentimes open source it. And so we're starting to see all of these like very well used prolific open source libraries that are solving what used to be esoteric problems, but that are used by, you know, millions of developers um, all around the world. And so this, this force shift is taking the as a service layer and exploding it even further so that you can think about it as almost having Lego for banking. So mm -hmm. it's these different composable blocks that all fit together in different kinds of ways. And then the added bonus is many of those are open source. And so the smartest people from all around the world can contribute to these, making them even stronger and even better. Amazing. So what does that do? You can build way better products much faster. And it's starting to attract some of the smartest engineers are now working on financial services products. I love that. And I, I think maybe it'd be helpful for the listeners if you could give a couple examples of those financial services infrastructure products that you say were previously driven by the economic buyer or the business lead that now you think are really being influenced by these developers. Let's use the example of payments. If you're providing a um, operating system for any type of business, it's a very natural extension that you might want to add payments. And traditionally, you know, payments will uh, expand the dollars that you are able to get from your customers. It's going to give you more margin. It's going to make people stickier. It was a very economic decision that this is the right thing to do. And so let's pick the infrastructure. And I think what has happened is companies that have done this historically have then ended up with well, now we have one system that helps us accept the money. We have another system that helps us store the money. We have a different system that helps us disperse the money. Now, when we're trying to create these good user experiences, again, we're, we're stitching these things together. So to use an example of, you know, Move, which is the company that has started this large developer conference, if you can provide composable blocks of all the different things that you want to do in payments without any of these middle layers together, engineers are able to build much better products and much um, more seamless experiences. And then as a result, they are becoming very influential in the buying decision because it's going to drive the revenue and the product experiences that these companies are able to do. Absolutely. And anytime we see a shift in who the buyer is, that naturally also influences the way products are built. And so maybe you could speak to that, right? If, if we now see this buyer, how does that ultimately influence how these products are expected to be built and maybe also how they're expected to be sold? I, I used to work with this great um, VP of engineering and I was on the product side. And what I loved the most is anytime I could come up with the best product experience, you know, versus some of my counterparts would be like, well, yeah, this is hard to build. This is not. His expression was always like, well, it's just software. We can build anything. And in financial services and payments, like that hasn't always been the case because you've just been limited by how things are stitched together, um, what systems you can tap into. But if you can imagine, come up with the absolute best product experience, and there's some really unique different ways to integrate financial services into software platforms. And if you could have the most composable bricks of how to do that, then you can drive the best user experiences. And, and so I think the product first thinking that's happening in financial services is very much coming to the forefront, both on the consumer side and on the business side, because now we have this just great composable architecture. So where do larger financial institutions come into this? Because they're not necessarily known as being the most technically savvy or the most composable code. I mean, I think something that you mentioned in your talk that we referenced at the beginning is that 40% of bank code is still in COBOL, which is pretty legacy. I think you even said that it's not really being taught very widely anymore. And so how does, how does that fit together? How do we square that circle of these larger financial institutions and this walk towards something a little more technologically driven and with developers at the center of that. Yeah, so the most off-site statistic, uh, which I think has stayed very constant, is just the, the level of, uh, you know, 
banking infrastructure has been around for a long time. COBOL is an old language. Uh, there's a lot of code written in COBOL. It is very hard to find COBOL developers right now. Um, there's also a lot of legacy software. Much of financial services is built on enterprise software that has been around since the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And the narrative has been that banks are never going to rip a lot of this out. Like, it's just way too risky. Hmm. And I think that is starting to change. Like, I did this talk in, in 2021, and there was already a ton of momentum towards developers. It's now, you know, almost 2024, and there's an entirely new platform shift that's driving even faster change, which is generative AI. And there's a lot of talk in financial services around the risks that are posed by generative AI. There should be more talk around what are the risks of not moving quickly enough towards this trend. And I think we're already seeing that a lot in uh, financial services and in insurance. CEOs from top down are really rethinking their strategy. Um, you know, how can they how can they leverage this platform shift? And how does that so how does that impact financial services infrastructure? I think it's challenging this notion that some of this infrastructure will never be replaced. Because I think what we're seeing is like take a loan origination system, for instance. There's been new loan origination systems, and it's been very hard to get that new tech in. But I think one of the reasons was the new tech was better, but probably not 10x better. Right. Whereas now with Gen AI, it's like, great, we've reimagined the workflow. It's going to take you one tenth as many people because, you know, if you take a, you know, an AML system, for instance, like we're going to automatically write the SAR reports for you. And so the products that are able to come along are so much better that it's challenging the notion that some of this old software is just never going to go. Um, and so I think that's point one. Point two on COBOL, right? Like, does it make sense to, you know, entirely rewrite systems in days past? Probably not. But if you look at GitHub Copilot, depending on the engineer, that's 30 to 100% increased productivity. So one school of thought is like, well, now you could just rewrite it faster. But you can imagine a world where LLMs get so good that you could feed in large portions of code written in COBOL and they would spit out the same amount of code um, or the same functionality of said code in a different language. You know, and we're not there yet, but the space is moving so quickly that this change and this shift is, is very much going to change some of these like notions that have been around for a very long time. Totally. It's a very foundational shift. And maybe one other shift I'd love for you to touch on are the regulatory shifts happening at the same time. You know, we did an episode recently where we talked about how different jurisdictions are implementing open banking or sandboxing. And I'm curious to know how you think those also fit into this trend of the increasing involvement of the developer. Yeah, I think the, well, the open banking trend in particular is pretty interesting. Um, and, you know, the U.S. is a little bit different than some other countries like the U.K. and even Brazil that have a, an open banking mandate from the government that banks have to share their data. And so you can think like, OK, does it make sense for every bank by themselves to independently develop and maintain and, and do all of these different types of APIs? Or is that an opportunity for broader open source products, projects, broader standards, such that it becomes a lot easier for financial institutions to maintain some of these, uh, some of these open connections and a lot easier for other companies, other software companies to connect into them. I think just to round things out, um, I think it's very exciting that the developer is playing a greater role, but maybe the question that listeners are asking themselves is how does this ultimately impact me, right? How does the customer ultimately see different kinds of financial services with this developer role becoming more prominent? What do you think this does really to the kinds of products that can be created? Yeah, I think this is the most exciting part, right? Like you can talk about infrastructure, but really what does better infrastructure do? It enables better consumer and better business experiences. Yeah. So I can think I can think of a couple examples, right? Like there's still 2 billion people that are underserved from a financial services point of view around the world. And there, there's many reasons for that. Um, but one of the reasons is that if you want to stand up banking infrastructure with all the software and, you know, especially in the US, it's going to cost you, you know, 10 to $30 a month just to keep the lights on. And, and that makes sense if you're going to get a mortgage and you're going to get all these different types of products, but it doesn't if you're going to have a low balance account. 
And so if you now have, and there are several examples, open source cores where you can just grab the software for free and build around it, you can imagine a very low maintenance cost of financial services, which will open access to, to many more people. Um, and so that's, that's one theme I'm excited about. And then the second is like, financial services might have more edge cases than any other industry around, right? Like the number of different ways that you can pay and different payment types and different sites, yeah. like it's just, it's, it's huge pain, right? And so if you take, there's now an open source um, ACH library and engineers from banks are running trillions of dollars through this library and catching all of these edge cases and fixing it. And so like just stuff is going to work better. Right. If everyone incorporates this hardened library that um, the best people against the world are testing against, um, all of us are going to have better products over time. All right. I hope you enjoyed this big idea. We do have a lot more on the way, including a new age of maritime exploration that takes advantage of AI and computer vision, plus AI for games that never end, and whether voice first apps may finally be having their moment. By the way, if you want to see our full list of 40 plus big ideas today, you can head on over to a16z.com slash big ideas 2024. It's time to build.